Welcome to the Mind, Body and Soul Show with artist, author and personal development coach John Morris. Inspiring, motivating and educating you on your journey to find balance in the craziness of day-to-day -day life. Learn from and listen to a man who has a wealth of life experience, from business to bodybuilding, artist to author, and has learned to deal with his own physical and mental wellness. But that's not all. Each week, John will be joined by guests from around the world and all walks of life, where they too will share their knowledge and expertise. And now, we welcome you to today's episode of the Mind, Body and Soul Show, with your host, John Morris. Well, hi there, folks. I hope you're doing great wherever you are in the world today. Welcome to the Mind, Body and Soul Show, where we help you find balance in the craziness of day-to-day -day life. I am, as always, your host, John Morris, and today I'm really, really excited because we're going to be talking about a topic, once again, that often doesn't get covered. The topic today is really about marriage and success, and it's really more about the pursuit of success. Relationships and entrepreneurs and business folk tend to be, you know, they go into relationships, but it tends to be one of the most shakiest and most talked about subjects of all, mainly because in the pursuit of success, the family is the thing that's usually forgotten about or sacrificed. My guests today, though, have shared their marriage union for over 37 years, if you can believe that. They have survived and thrived in the world of business and entrepreneurship, and I could think of no two better people to speak on this subject. I'm going to introduce them individually um, because they are two incredible human beings. Firstly, a man who took uh, a company that was losing a million plus dollars per year and turned it right around to make it one of the most successful, if not the most successful wrestling companies in the entire world. He's an entrepreneur, he's an author and a podcaster in his own right with his successful show, 83 Weeks. He is the awesome Eric Bischoff. And before I bring them on, we're just going to introduce his wonderful wife as well, podcaster in her own right with her podcast show, We're Talking Shift, health and nutrition coach, author, and my friend, the awesome Laurie Bischoff. So welcome to you both. How are you doing today? Doing great. Excellent, John. Thanks for having us. I got my jar of moonshine here. We're famous for <laughs> moonshine here in the States. I like to start my day with a little moonshine. Room temperature, of course, no ice. Um, so if it's, I fall, it's that kind of morning, is it, Eric? You know. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> gotta hydrate, you know. Absolutely, I've got my bottle of water beside me, and I know Laura, you've always got yours as well. How's the yeah. weather out there for you guys? Uh, it's beautiful today. Um, as a matter of fact, Lori got me up early, so I was prepared for this, and I took my dog Nikki outside and went, "Wow, this is going to be a beautiful day today." Probably mid fifties Fahrenheit, not Celsius, nice. and uh, a little sunny, but uh, gorgeous actually. Good. And it's actually been, Laurie and I, we always laugh about the weather whenever we're doing a, a show together. Um, the weather outside has actually been very, very warm today. Unusually warm uh, for this time of year. And we're only just putting central heating on now, folks. So we're into November. We're in Scotland and we've survived until November before putting central heating on. So that's a big success Excellent. thing for sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, Laurie and Eric, you know, you guys have survived 30 years of, uh, 37 years of marriage, which is a phenomenal thing in itself. Um, absolutely incredible. Um, briefly, how did the two of you meet? Um, I forgot. It was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> I need my Prevagen. Prevagen, please. Prevagen on the set. I call him Mr. Romance. <laughs> <laughs> No, we, we, we met um, at a time when I was kind of dabbling in the uh, fashion model business, and Lori and a good friend of hers had created their own agency. Lori had been modeling for a long time since so she was just a youngin, as they say here in the States, just a youngin. Um, Nobody says that here. Well, they do in Alabama. I was just yeah. there last week. We're weekend. in Wyoming. <laughs> Nobody says that here. But uh, she had been modeling since she was a child, and... Uh, her and a friend decided they were going to start their own agency, and I happened to wander in one day looking for a gig, and I looked over, and Lori was standing. She had her back to me. Um, she was doing something, and I was out in another part of the office, but I took a glimpse in her office, and I said, huh, how about that? <laughs> and that's where it all started. <laughs> It's a true romance story, isn't Again, it? Again, really see? Is. Yeah, Mr. Romance. 
Hey, I'm being authentic, right? That's what that that's what we do here. Absolutely. Yes, because there's a lot of people that will say, oh, we met and eyes crossed lovingly across the room. You know, Katie and I, we met online. We had our first date and it, everything just clicked. Um, it was not one of those whirlwind romances. She initially saw my profile picture and thought I was a really old guy. And then she saw a little bit closer and was like, oh, wow, he's actually not. So there you go. Um, but um, one of the interesting things I find about relationships in particular with both the people that I work with and friends and things is the difference of personalities. And I'm really intrigued to ask you both how your personalities, personalities differ one from the other. Mm. Uh, well, I would say, I would say Eric is got the ability to really, really focus. One of his, one of his traits is he can kind of just block everything else out and focus on one thing and, and stick with it uh, until, you know, until he's done. Um, whereas I have a tendency to spin plates, a lot of plates at the same time, which sometimes is really fun because I like the variety of doing a bunch of different things, but also uh, having having the ability to focus on one thing and block out other things is something I have to work at. So I would say that's a big difference between the two of us. Uh, I think um, Eric's a big picture thinker mm -hmm. and I'm a detail person. So I think we complement each other a lot in that mm -hmm. respect. Um, I'm, I'm extraordinarily organized and detail oriented. And, and Eric is very much focused on, on the end game and, and just knocking down the big things to make the vision, you know, happen. I think that's really, really cool. Yeah. And I'll, I'll take that a step further. I think at, at the core, Lori is a much more pragmatic person than I am. She's more organized, even, you know, in just day-to-day -day living than I am. Um, I, I, throughout my life, as an adult life at least, have probably reacted more emotionally to things where Lori tends to react a little more intellectually uh, than I do. So that's, I think that's a big difference at mm -hmm. its core. And it, again, comp we complement each other in that way. She's talked me off the ledge more times than I can count. Um, but it's helped balance me in that respect. It's great to be an A type personality, which I think I am. I'm very aggressive. You know, see big, all that happy stuff that sounds great. But on a day to day basis, it can sometimes be a real problem when you're reacting emotionally to things instead of kind of breaking them down into little pieces and attacking them more intellectually than emotionally. That's really interesting because both Katie and I share that same thing. Um, in, in a previous life, I suppose I was the one that she frequently had to talk off the ledge, you know. And I, I don't know if it's whether well, something to do with the entre entrepreneurial personality, the business mindset, almost, um, or if it's just that I was in a you know completely different you know space and time and everything. Whereas now, you know, it, it's more of an equal footing. Um, so I, I, you know, I, and sometimes I think with business. It's important, I think, to have that mindset of, you know, you're going for it and you're passionate about it. But then I suppose it's it's how we do it and not flying off the handle and everything. So that's that's really interesting for, for sure. Um, but did you think that that personality really helped you in business, Eric? Sure. Yeah. Of course it did. It also cratered me a few times too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, as I, you know, kind of step back at this stage of my life, it's a lot easier for me to kind of step back and look at things um, more honestly yeah. than perhaps I did in the past. Um, and there's been multiple times when my aggressive personality mm -hmm. or the big picture approach um, has benefited mm -hmm. in, in greatly, but there are, there are bodies and opportunities that I left behind yeah. as a result. So <laughs> yeah, that's all right. They'll never find them out back there. <laughs> but, it, but it is interesting, you know, because I know KT said to me frequently when, you know, when we very first got married, she was like, you weren't like this when we were dating. And then, you know, whole sequence of events and things had happened. And it was almost like, had she known, you know, <laughs> what was to unfold and, and uh, to, to go through. It's like, 
she still would have gone through it. She, you know, I've asked her straight out, and she, you know, she had said that. Um, but well, what's she going to say now, John? Really? Well, what's exactly. she going to say? Like, no, you know, if I had to do you? this all over again, I'd have left you in the dust. <laughs> you and your profile picture well, it looks like your you dad. Wonder, you know, it's because there was. Um, and I think sometimes, you know, l looking now through her eyes, it's almost like had I gone through what she had to put up with me, I probably would have been sitting there saying, is this really the right person that I want to be with and go forward and everything? And then the crazy thing is you, you chip and change and, you know, you, you this other guy and she's like, right now I've got to get to know you all over again now. So it's, it's a very bizarre thing at times. How is it for you, Laurie, from a female perspective when, because Eric and I, I'm sure we can talk about the male perspective, of, you know, what we've just discussed, but how is it for you seeing that um, more aggressive personality, more dominant personality? Well, oh my goodness. <laughs> you know, I mean, when we first met, um, I had never met anybody like Eric. So um, this was a, this was a. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> <laughs> Turned out to be pretty good. I'm just going to say, but. but After no. 37 years, I'm going to guess that it was pretty good. <laughs> pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're out of the testing zone. Um, but no, I, I just, I was a very. Uh, I was a very open-minded person and I was very up for adventures and, um, but I was, uh, I was a very positive thinking kind of person. Um, but I wasn't necessarily a big picture person or a, uh, um, kind of blaze my path person, I guess I could say. And so when I met Eric and he's got, big ideas. I was just, I was very excited about that. It seemed like we just had so much fun together. And, um, and it was just, uh, it was, it was really cool to be with somebody, um, that was such a different kind of personality that I had, than I had experienced before. So I didn't have, uh, I didn't have brothers, I, uh, my dad wasn't that kind of personality. The, you know, people I had dated prior didn't have that kind of personality. So this was, this was new for me and it was really, it was really fun and exciting. That's really awesome. And really yeah. interesting as well. One of the questions I suppose that we're curious about, obviously we've both been successful in business and we've got an event coming up this weekend, which is, you know, talking about the new psychology of winning, whatever that means these days. I've got my own thoughts on it, my own ideas. I think, yeah, thinking about this. So in the pursuit of success, a lot of people tend to neglect the, you know, the, the things that really matter in terms of the family, in terms of your kids and, and you know, husband, wife, whatever it might be. Um, how did you guys stay grounded, I suppose, in the big business niche you care or took care of home life? Hmm. Um, I, I don't know. It wasn't a conscious effort. I didn't have to discipline myself. I don't think Lori did either. We, I'll just speak for myself. To me, family was the reason I was doing what I was doing. Um, it was my motivation. It was the impetus behind anything and everything that I was doing. I always had a picture in my mind, at least, and the picture changed, of course, from time to time. But the picture that I had in my mind through all of the things that I went through was, how will this benefit my family? What will this do for my kids? So the family and Lori were always the first priority, the business never was. That's not to say there were times when my commitment to the business and the things I was doing mm -hmm. from the outside looked like they were taking a priority because they took up so much of my time and my conscious thought. I'd go to bed at night and dream about, and which is not uncommon, but think about, dream about, wake up with ideas and you know, can't wait to get out the door and get to work. So from the outside, one would probably suspect that oh, all he cares about is his work. It's not true. The work was just a vehicle. Success was just a vehicle. Money was just a vehicle. It wasn't the it wasn't the destination. It was one of the stones I had to step on to get where I was going. How yeah. was it for you, Lori? Yeah, I think that's 
that's exactly what I would say as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, I think that we were able to maintain our focus on why we were doing any of the things we were doing. And so for us, we never, we never veered away from that main focus, which is why are we doing this? And that's because we were growing our family. So, you know, all of the things that we were doing or Eric was doing was, was to support that family foundation and our, um, our evolution as a family and, and our development. So I think it's really, really important to be able to not lose sight of the target because it's, it's very easy to, yeah. you know, for lots of bright, shiny objects everywhere. Uh, right. And uh, especially when you're having success, because yeah. it's yeah. easier to afford the bright, shiny objects mm -hmm. and be distracted by them. But if I can, I'm going to back up just a little bit. Mm -hmm. This commitment, natural commitment that we had to each other and to our family, our kids, um, existed before success, you know, mm -hmm. before we were successful and, you know, you define success in different ways, but there was a period in time where financially and critically and all the other ways, you know, I, I guess we were successful. Um, but even when we weren't, when we were just flat ass broke, mm -hmm. when I was bouncing checks in order to buy diapers, um, we had zero money. And we were uh, poor. <laughs> well, pretty, no, pretty much. never poor, broke. Yeah, broke. That poor is a state of mind. Right. <laughs> we're we're never poor. But Bo to that point, broke. Yeah. Even when we shouldn't have, by any estimation, um, gone out and had dinner together, or gone out for you know drinks and to hear our favorite yeah. band, or had our what we call date nights. Mm -hmm. Friday night was date night. Come hell or high water, I don't care what happened Thursday. Thursday was gone. Friday night was a date night, and it was like wipe the slate clean, forget about everything else. We're going out to enjoy each other's company because I think we both realized, and it just came naturally for us. It wasn't a thought process. Didn't read about it in a book, or I didn't. Maybe she did, but it was like we we valued each other so much and we enjoyed each other so much that we weren't going to let our circumstances drag us down. So we would go out and celebrate Friday night. Like it was our second or third date, mm -hmm. especially the second one. That was awesome. <laughs> but What's in that but moonshine, we, would, Eric? <laughs> we, we would go out and enjoy our Friday nights as if we had a million dollars in our checking account. You know, we didn't spend frivolously, but, we spent money we didn't have because mm -hmm. the priority was our relationship. Everything else came after that. Mm -hmm. That is almost like a breath of fresh air when you say that, because a lot of the time, you know, it's people get into relationships for a variety of reasons, of course. Um, and oftentimes really don't understand what to relate to someone else means. But the fact that you're able to say, you know, for both of you, you know, we just enjoyed spending time together. We didn't have to be going anywhere or doing anything specifically. We just enjoyed and loved spending time together. And we always kept, you know, things fresh and date nights and everything like that. Because I think that's one of the biggest things. I know we're going to talk this, about this a little bit later in the show, that after a year or six months, and sometimes for people even less, you know, it's almost like they stopped trying. And that's, I think, one of the biggest contributing factors that I found was people stopped trying. And then it's the communication aspect that goes out the window as well. I'm assuming for, for both of you, you always found a way to communicate successfully um, whatever was going on in your lives. Yeah, I think it, communication has evolved a lot too. Um, you know, there's there's a there's a learning process um, with learning to communicate with your partner as well. And um, you know, I think for for me, it was learning just to communicate. Period. Um, I didn't see a lot of communication demonstrated for me when I was growing up between my parents, not, not what I would call really positive, healthy communication. So, uh, so that was a learning curve I was on, um, it, learning to communicate and, and bring things up that were uncomfortable. Um, and I think for Eric, he had no problem communicating. <laughs> However, I would sometimes over communicate. Yeah, that's a good way to and put it. And not in a fun way. Over communicating in, in a way that wasn't always um, productive. <laughs> yeah, there we go. So, so that, you know, I think that that's common though in relationships. Um, is, you know, in the early, in the early stages, um, 
everything is just always great. You're only focused on all of the fun you're having and, and all of the newness of things. But then, you know, as you spend some time together and then maybe you um, come up against each other, you know, you have a challenge or an obstacle, that's when you need to really have your communication skills um, in, intact or at least be willing to say, I'm not I'm not sure how to express this, so I'm going to do my best. And then you each, you know, show each other some grace and help the other person express what it is that's up for them so that you can learn. It's a learning process, I think. I still am learning. Well, I was just, I didn't want to interrupt you, but I've only, I'd say within the last three or four years, gotten to the point where my default reaction to things isn't just emotional and blurting out going back to the way you know mm -hmm. it's a big part of my personality and you know we, we've had difficult situations before and we've seen things from completely different angles before it's not like everything's always been perfect although it's pretty freaking close really but <laughs> but my when it comes to tough situations, tough communications where feelings are hurt or there's a misunderstanding, that aggressive part of my personality, which is really just insecurity in some respects and defensiveness, doesn't always, didn't, and sometimes still doesn't, always come out right. And Lori's always been the rock of Gibraltar in terms of being able to hear my stupid stuff and see my reaction and know that that's my process. I, I, I explode, I vomit, you know, reaction and emotion. And then about 45 minutes later, I start actually thinking about what I said. <laughs> and then it kind of comes back around. Now, I've gotten better, but mm -hmm. it's because of Lori. Yeah. You know, in the beginning, my, my default position is always when somebody says something I don't want to hear, it's always lash out. Go yeah. for it, go for, as Lori has said to me mm -hmm. before. I always go for the juggler first. <laughs> I, He's an attacker. I, I never throw a jab. I always go for the throat. And that's not, and I, it sounds funny, right? You can make it sound, oh, that's kind of cool mm -hmm. in its own weird way. It's not. It's hurtful. It's unproductive. And it actually puts me in a frame of mind as the words are coming out of my mouth or I'm even more defensive and aggressive. It's really, really a wrong way to communicate. But it's taken, you know, 30 some odd years for Lori to kind of help me learn that. Mm -hmm. And I, I get a little bit better at it every day. It's still possible for me sometimes, but I find myself <clears throat> as a result of what I've learned from Lori and the way she communicates. Um, I'm not nearly as angry as I normally am because I just don't let things push yeah. that button in me. It's, it's a lot harder to piss me off now mm -hmm. than it was even a couple of years ago. Yeah. That's incredible because I feel in some ways you're not the only ones. There's a couple of others that are friends with, with both Katie and I, and it's almost looking like a mirror into the future because, you know, like I said, I was that angry guy. What Eric is describing here, folks, was the person that I was, you know, for five years after leaving uh, ministerial positions. Um, sometimes in life you can get so bogged down and so frustrated and sometimes it can be a natural part of your personality when you are that passionate person um when you don't necessarily always think clearly you tend to speak you know before you have really thought because that's believe it or not the way that your brain is designed and then you look back and it's like you're exhausted your wife's in tears or your husband's in tears or you know whatever and you're like oh my goodness and oftentimes it's the same situations that go round and round and round time and time again. And that's what we came up against so many times. It was never about money for us. It was often about family stuff or stuff that was going on with the church. And when I, certainly for me, when I found, you know, just that piece and I let all that stuff go, there were still times like Eric says, you know, that, you know, for me nowadays, it's, it's more rare, which is wonderful. I love being peaceful i just genuinely I, I you know i absorb it as much as i can because being angry for me caused so much you know illness and change of um, genetic structure and things and and it was just like eric was saying it was not productive you know it is what it is um I think oftentimes people go into relationships thinking that you're just meant to know how to be around the other person and 
you know, mm. it, it really isn't that way. You know, like they were saying, you know, you've got to communicate. You've got to figure out how to communicate as well. How much do you share? How much do you not? You know, and, and choosing your right times. Um, for Katie and I, we refuse to have in-depth discussion or meaningful discussion uh, regarding, you know, making big decision stuff when we're both tired, when we're both hungry, or when we've both just come from, you know, busy situation. Um, so I don't know about you, the, the pair of you, if there's a time that you notice that you're like, yeah, we're not going to talk right, <laughs> talk about this right now because oh, yeah. you just know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hunger is a good one. This this person <laughs> and, and my, my our kids inherited that gene too. When, when they're hungry, <laughs> they're hangry. So yes. um, talking about any anything other than what should we eat is, is usually not a good idea. I used to have a business partner <clears throat> years ago. Uh, Jason Hervey, we had a television production company together and we were based in LA and we were having a lot of success, <clears throat> but Jason always used the acronym HALT. When you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired, don't talk to anybody. Stop. <laughs> HALT. If any of those conditions exist, feed yourself, let your food digest, and then have a conversation. So hung, hungry, angry, lonely, and tired, halt, stop whatever you're doing. Don't do it with any other people because you're going to piss them off or hurt their feelings. So that's good. That's mine. That's I good. think that's I fantastic. I really do. I've, I've not heard that one before, but it is so true. I mean, for me, it used to be standing in queues, you know, when you're going to the, the supermarket or shopping mall or whatever. And if you're hungry, if there was a bit of hair that was in my face or if it was warm and there's other people around me, I would, <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not ashamed to say it because I don't hold any, you know, shame or anything, but there'd be times where I would get more and more frustrated. And as I got more and more frustrated, I would get more and more vocal to the point that the people surrounding me was like, okay, we really need to check out really quickly because this guy's, you know, he, he's going to blow in any minute. I mean, if nothing else, it made the, the cues go quicker, you know, and, and, and we got out there and I got fed. But Yeah, but at, the end, of, but, but at the end of it, in the process of reacting that way, you probably left that store, grabbed whatever you grabbed, got in your car, and you were probably, you, 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 had, an, you had a hangover. You, were, yeah. you, were, you had an angry hangover. Uh, and it affects the way you look at things. It affects the way you react to other things. And that's, that's one of the things that I, I, I really noticed the most. And one of the things I'm most grateful for is having learned this through Lori. I didn't do it on my own. Trust me. Um, it's like I said, it's when I say it's really hard to piss me off. I'm really grateful for that because mm -hmm. in my unpissed off frame of mind, I'm better at my work I'm more pleasant to be around, which, you know, we hear all the laws of attraction. Well, that's true yeah. because when you're that guy, like you are standing in line and, you know, irritated, they don't know why you're irritated or angry. They don't know that you're hungry or that you're warm or you don't like hair on your face. They don't know why you're angry. You're just this bundle of negativity yeah. and they don't want to be near it. The same is true. Here's mine. When someone cuts in front of me in the line, it, it's everything it takes, it's my discipline. That's where I get to practice mm -hmm. because my first reaction is aggressive. It, you know, any kind of disrespect yeah. to me, even in the slightest way, it's like the one pet peeve I have, but I'm aware of it now more so than I normally would be. But I don't let that stuff irritate me. I don't let it take me down because somebody in the store makes me angry. Somebody cuts me off in traffic. I get all worked up about it. And I feel all justified about it. But when I show up to my meeting an hour and a half later, I'm still carrying some of that around. Correct. It shows. You know, you might not right. think it does, but it does. Yeah, Absolutely. That, that, that emotional uh, energetic current that you've generated goes with you and it walks mm -hmm. into the room even before you do and everybody around feels it. It, yeah. it affects everybody. So it's been, it's been a nice process <laughs> of of him yeah kind of getting really what that is is learning how to master your emotions yes and yeah. so but whereas before he was really a slave to his emotions mm -hmm. and now he's you know learned to master them more so that he can control his he can respond in a way that is positive rather than react in a negative yeah. a knee-jerk reaction um and which is for him usually attack mode mm -hmm. uh so and then for me I had to learn to actually talk. 
So because that's just as an, that's really annoying too. If there's an issue and your partner is the one is clamming up that is frustrating for the other person. It's not good for the person clamming up because you're not expressing anything. You're, you're, you're so in control of your emotions that you actually repress things. And that's not a good place to be either because then you build resentment. It builds up. So for me, it was kind of the opposite learning that um, I needed to communicate, learning to um, express what I was feeling uh, in a, again, in a, in a positive way and not just a, you know, an, an out of control basket case way or just not communicating at all. So that was my learning curve. Obviously, Laurie and I, you know, we, we've talked a number of times on various shows and things, you know, and I guess my takeaway for anybody that's watching this at this point in the show is that you can choose how you respond. And like Eric was saying, just because somebody cuts him up on the on the freeway and things, you know, it doesn't mean he needs to turn into angry wolf or anything because somebody's rude to me. And again, Eric, you know, to, to your point, rudeness and just were two of my biggest things as well. Um, for whatever reason, it just used to rub me the wrong way. But nowadays, you know, I'm more just in my mind. I was like, okay, I can't control what they do or how they're going to respond, but I can control how I respond because that's the thing, like you both rightly said, you know, when you blow your top, um, it's been a, it's what we call a slow feed. So it's, it's almost like that bubbling pot that just eventually just explodes. And it, it often doesn't just stop there. And what argument that happened and it should have been done and dusted in five minutes, it went on sometimes for three or four hours with both people getting more and more upset and everything. Um, so absolutely. So it's humongous pr progress, I think, for all of us, for sure. We're going to jump quickly to a commercial break. Um, but folks, when we come back, Laurie and Eric will be here and uh, we'll be looking at some more questions. So we'll see you in a moment or two. Hello and welcome to the Los Angeles Tribune. Since 1886, our name has been a part of the world of journalism. We've earned a reputation for being a publication that practices integrity, authenticity, and responsibility. For general inquiries, contact today. Thank you on behalf of the Los Angeles Tribune team. Okay, folks, we are back and we are talking all things about marriage and the, in the pursuit of success with Laurie and Eric Bischoff. Thank you so much for, for being here, of course, and for you guys for sticking with us. Got them later on in the show towards the end, guys. Um, I suppose moving on from where we've just been, um many people not just in the business world i think it's i think it's actually worldwide now they seem to struggle with keeping things fresh and almost take each other for granted for you two being married for 37 years again which is phenomenal how do you still find ways to keep your relationship fresh hmm. well um i think one of the things that is always fun in, in, in my mind is that we are very, very forward thinking people. So th there's kind of two sides to this coin. One is we're, we're really good about just being in the moment and really enjoying and appreciating what, what we have, where we are, what we're doing, um, all, what we've created. We're really good about being in the now and appreciating that and not losing sight of that. But at the same time, we're also extremely forward thinking. We're always coming up with things we want to do, plans we want to make, things we want to create. You know, what do we want to develop next? Where do we want to go? Why do we want to do this? So I, I think being able to, to, I guess, really wrap your head around those two practices. For me, that's one, one thing or two things, I guess, that, that keeps it fresh and exciting. Um, and I think, I think the other thing is we are very good about getting our quality time together still, which, which is easy, mm -hmm. but it also is just as important that we each have our quality time alone. 
And I think that's really important too. We each respect the other person's desire to have some time to, you know, think or do whatever that is that's important to them. We don't, we're not, we don't have to be joined at the hip 24 seven. I don't think that's necessarily healthy either, but so balancing the together time and the alone time also, I I feel is really an important aspect. And I guess all of this is kind of connected, you know, Mm -hmm. but Lori's just fun. (laughs) <laughs> she, I mean, she's got a great sense of humor. Um, she's she's very creative. She's got a great imagination. Um, she's got a very high-powered intellectual curiosity about things. So we can engage in a conversation. We can go out to dinner tomorrow night with no plans, with nothing necessarily on our minds. And within 20 minutes of sitting in a restaurant, we're engaged in a conversation that neither one of us thought we were going to have. But it's fun, um, you know. And you know, fun. I use that term a lot. Fun has changed over the years. You know, in the beginning, yeah. our fun was going out and being with our friends and yeah. date more. nights and part partying. All the things that you know you would associate with a a younger mm-hmm. couple. You know, at that time of their lives, that kind of fun was, and we had lots of it. Mm-hmm. As we got older, our our idea of fun changed. And certainly when you have kids, then your idea of fun mm-hmm. changed. But we just have fun together, which makes it easy, you know. And it is sense of humor. And Lori talked about, you know, being in the moment. And some of those terms are so overused and abused. and People don't really know what it means when they say it. But I think one of the advantages of learning to just appreciate the fact that, hey, I get to go out and have a cocktail and have dinner with my beautiful wife. Not a lot of people get to say that. Some people never have. Mm -hmm. So once you're grateful for the little stuff, it becomes so much easier to have fun Mm -hmm. because you're not wishing you were doing something else or thinking about what you're going to do next week or thinking about your job or thinking about this. You're just out in that moment enjoying company and Mm -hmm. Fun can come in so many different ways at that point. It doesn't have to be going out to a fancy restaurant or four-star hotel or jumping on a plane and flying to an exotic place. It doesn't have to be your vacation. You don't wait all year to have fun for two weeks. We have fun going out for dinner. We have fun taking our dog for a walk. Yeah. We we literally, to make that point even more, back pre-children when we were broke. (laughs) We had just as much fun um, spending, you know, $4 on some cheap champagne and fake crab legs and having brunch together at home. We had just as much fun doing that as we do, you know, now um, going to another city, staying in a nice hotel and having a really nice dinner somewhere. the 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 level of energy and fun and enjoyment we have is the same no matter what what that outside uh thing is that we have going on so i I think that's really true and the and the thing is i think a lot of people literally start minimizing their fun actually ruining their fun with their partner because they stop focusing on the right things they start focusing on the things that start to become annoying to them or that they don't like or what they think needs to change or isn't right so rather than rather than disciplining yourself and keeping your focus on what is good about what you have, what is good about your relationship? What are you reminding yourself what you really love and enjoy about your partner? Mm -hmm. Because it is really easy. We see it all the time Mm -hmm. for people to just, you know, the focus just drifts over to all the things that they think are missing, are wrong, are not right, are bad, are grass is greener. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And that's a, that's an easy trap that so many people fall into. And again, it is all about, managing what you're mm-hmm. thinking about and, and focusing on. That's a, a huge part of it. Yeah. Well, it's like we talked about on your show, I think uh, last Friday or the Friday before, you know, all about the mindset and, mm-hmm. you know, you, you are going to attract whatever you focus on. If you focus on, Hey, my partner is a, you know, fill in the blank um, in a negative way, that's all you're going to see about him or her. Um, right. if equally, if you're focusing on, like Eric was saying, you know, his beautiful wife and, and you go back and listen to the words that Eric was using, 
you know, it's still very, very important about your words, about how you think about the other person, because that's what comes out of your mouth, you know. And even when people say something in, in jest or joking, it's still coming from a place that's in there. So, you know, to, to Eric and Laurie's credit, you know, they're still finding fun and looking for fun in the simplest activities. Katie and I went for a beautiful walk this morning and was surrounded by birch trees, you know, just five minutes away from our home. And we just loved it. You know, she's at work and, and I'm here now, but it was something that we had because it was that moment we have together. What I found actually during lockdown was that Katie and I uh, were both, thankfully, we're obviously in a bigger house now, but we were working together, you know, 24 hours a day. And I'm just thinking, you know, had I not gone through those changes that I've gone through, it could have been a very miserable experience, I think, for both of us. Um, but at the same point, you know, all of a sudden you realize we work really well together. We enjoy being together. You know, now that we're in the, the studio and things, you know, yes, it's a big enough room where I do my art down the other side of the room and she's up here, you know, working on the books and things. Um, and we have fun sometimes just chatting, you know, and it's the simplest of things that you get the work done. You just enjoy being with each other. But once you start to focus on the negative things, what's, you know, in your mind at least, wrong with your partner, I think that's actually where relationships can start to, to fall apart. Any thoughts on that? I think whether you're focusing on something that's irritating you about your partner or you just focus on something that's irritating you about your situation or your your, mom, your, your, your condition, whether it's work or financial or you don't oh. like where you live, you yeah. don't like your apartment, you don't like your home, you don't like your car. Your body. Yeah, your body. <laughs> You know, there's a lot of things that so I mean, oh, come on, it's life, man. There's yeah. a lot of things that can distract you. And I think it's as Lori said, having the, the mental discipline uh, and control over yourself. So when you catch yourself, when I, I do this every day, I do it every single day. When I catch myself thinking of something negative, I say a little prayer, which always opens up my mind. It always grounds me in the moment. I start to think, wait a minute, what are you complaining about, you dipshit? You've got everything. You know, you've got your health. You've 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 got a wonderful family. You've got opportunity. You've got all the things going. What are you complaining about? And the minute I say that to myself, it changes. But if you don't have, if you're not aware, some because I think sometimes I know I'll speak for myself. I only know myself, kinda, but. It's so easy, especially if you're an entrepreneur, right? Because there's always something that's not going the way you want it to go. Mm -hmm. um, if you allow yourself while you're out having dinner or going for a hike or whatever it is you're doing, if you're thinking about those negative things or those challenges, you're not really there. You know, you're not really in the moment. God, I'm using the hell out of that term that I don't like. But you know what I mean? You're not really there. You're only half there. And then the other person feels like, well, I guess I'm not that interesting. Or, oh, I don't really have anything to say that's important. Yeah. And that's kind of like the beginning of a bad situation, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, too, mm -hmm. because right now, uh, right now, I guess it's been a while since we all have phones, uh, you know, attached to us like another limb. Um, it's It's really easy for people to get into the habit of, not being in the moment that you're sitting there with somebody or you're having a conversation and the other person picks up their phone and looks at it. And the message that that communicates yeah. is powerful. Yeah. Um, not it's a, not good. Not in a good <laughs> no. way. Uh, no. And so that's a distraction though. That's, that's, you know, become an addiction mm -hmm. really for so many of us that we have to really, really pay attention um, because it's just, it becomes autopilot. You become like Pavlov's dogs every mm -hmm. time that phone pings or vibrates. Whatever you're doing comes to a screeching halt and it grabs your attention. Or what's worse in some, now I was just, uh, I was out of town last week at a business meeting with three or four people who I, I love them dearly. They're very close friends and business partners. I enjoy their company. When we're together, it's almost always productive and it's wrapped around a lot of good times. But I, would, I remember it was the last Thursday I was sitting in an office. Now, I flew, you know, took me all day to get there. I had to fly there for this meeting. I stayed there for two or three days. My time is very valuable to me. Whether I'm just sitting out on my deck with my dog, 
you know, smoking a cigar and drinking a beer or whether I'm working or whatever, even when I'm not doing anything productive, that's valuable time for me. Mm -hmm. So for me to jump on a plane, fly halfway across the country, sit in a room full of people, and I noticed at one point people aren't talking on their phones. They're looking at their phones and having conversations. Conversations. Looking at yeah, oh yeah, 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 and then they're, you know, in, in the midst of another conversation, it's and again, thanks to Lori. Now, several years ago, mm -hmm. I'd have pulled the pin on that grenade, yeah, and I would just would have let that shrapnel fly, and whoever survived, survived. Whoever didn't, didn't. It wouldn't have mattered to me, but I kind of kept my mouth shut and didn't let it anger me. First and foremost, I didn't let it irritate me, and then found a way to by you know, forcing people to kind of engage with me, put their phones down, and then it, we, we went along our merry way. But again, that's an example of mm -hmm. allowing you, you think you're, you're in the room, you're sitting there, everybody's in that meeting ostensibly to make progress, but they can't get off their phones to do it. That's another, yeah. it's, a, it's, it's disrespectful is mm -hmm. what it is. Yeah. It, it's crazy the fact that people have now become so conditioned. And, and Laurie, you're exactly right. I'll be speaking about this, I think, at the end of the, uh, next month. Um, all about how phones have now become, you know, basically addictive substances, more addictive pretty much than anything else that's out there right now. Um, and the issues that that's causing with the eyes and the brain and everything else. But that's a whole other topic for another time. One of the things that I want to ask um, for, for both of you is, because I know we, we've touched on this a little bit briefly, um, but in every relationship, there are bumps in the road. How did you weather the storms? Well, I would say we only really, honestly, had a couple storms. What, what I would call a storm. You mean it, personal relationship yeah, issues? Yeah. And so. And they were relatively minor in the big scheme of things. I mean, I, so I think on that note, whether you have lots of storms or, you know, whatever, um, I think that, I think it's really important that you have the ability to forgive your partner. Forgiveness is a really big, important aspect of growing together in a relationship. If you can't, um, you know, be the one that needs to forgive the other person, then you obviously have, have some more communicating to do. Um, and the person that is asking for forgiveness, if, you know, if, if somebody has said something or done something that they feel they know that they shouldn't have said or done and it was wrong and they've apologized, ha have you apologized in the right way? Did you really apologize? Did you really, are you really sorry? And, and then why and what are you going to do about it? Like, you know, are you going to change your behavior or whatever? How do you how do you make amends? So I think on, on both sides of that, whether you need to be forgiven or whether you are the one doing the forgiving, that is something that is critically important. And and there are people that I've worked with, couples that sometimes somebody will say they've forgiven, but then their actions moving forward don't actually indicate that. Like they're still in, in various ways sort of punishing their partner. That's not really true forgiveness either, just because you say it, but then you don't move forward, you know, uh, with that burden off of your shoulders, if you're still punishing your partner, then you haven't really forgiven them. You haven't, you haven't worked through whatever it is you need to work through. So I think that that's a, that's a big one. Well, you've had to forgive me more than I've had to forgive you. So you, you're the authority on that. <laughs> I don't know about that, but I, uh, I think that, um, also, you know, it's, you're, inevitably you will run into challenges. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just part of life. If, if you don't, then you're not really living. Right. And a lot of people, that's where, that's where they start to become, they move from being one unit into two. They mm -hmm. move from being on the same team to on opposing teams. And, and I think that if you keep in mind that the challenges and the speed bumps that you encounter are your opportunities. They're, they're not, you know, it's not a battle that somebody has to win making somebody lose. It's your opportunity personally to figure out what you need to do to evolve, what you need to do to, um, you know, 
somehow develop yourself a little bit more so that you can manage this and overcome it and, and move through it in the most productive, positive way possible. Mm -hmm. So I think that there are so many people very willing to um, give up, uh, you know, relationships um, have become pretty much, you know, they're so disposable. Yeah. Uh, and not that that's a new thing, but what's new is that I, I think is that people aren't willing to even try to mm -hmm. in, an on, in an honest way. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. just easier to say, okay, we're done with this. Let's move on. But when you haven't figured out and learned how to move through those challenges in a positive, productive way, then what happens is you get rid of that person and then you go on to the next one and you repeat mm -hmm. the same thing. Yeah. And so people go through their lives, go through these relationships, um, never really figuring out how to make it work because they haven't, they haven't turned the spotlight around to themselves, their own right. beliefs, their own behavior yeah. and the things that they need to do themselves to develop more and in order to manage things better. And then it's so sweet then when you do that, when you overcome the challenges, when you figure it out, whatever it is that's got you all, you know, twisted up, mm -hmm. it, it's such a wonderful, uh, you know, way to go, wow, I just, I just grew. I just became a better version of myself. I mean, that's a pretty good feeling. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Katie and I frequently talk about iron sharpening iron. Um, you know, and it's very, you know, the, the relationship that we have is almost like knocking the hard edges off each other, um, you know, because I know that, you know, this year, as I've shared a number of times, this year has been really a big year of growth uh, for both of us. Um, and in a really phenomenal way to the point now that our relationship is so much better, but it is often a good place to start with looking inward, you know, if there's issues going on, if there have been issues in other relationships going on, and it's still the same recurring pattern, it's not a bad thing just to, and it's it's not something to be afraid of, but to look inside and say, maybe I've actually got something here that I need to work on and whatever that might be. And however that solution may be found, you know, is, is open for discussion, but that's always a good place to start, I think. Um, and, and Laurie, to, you know, like you were saying, you know, I think so many people now, both in marriage and just in relationships in general, just throw in the towel so easy, um, you know, and that's why I'm really glad that I've got both of you on because, you know, the, the your records are showing at the moment that certain marriages, you know, people are getting divorced, you know, <laughs> some can, sometimes within a day. Um, believe it or not, and other people are getting divorced within, not mentioning any names, but within, you know, a year or two. So the, the era where you had marriages that lasted 40, 50, 60 years seemed to be, you know, going and, and greatly decreasing. What advice would you give to younger couples that are just starting out on their journey? Mm. That's yours. <laughs> well, I think, I mean, I think the things we just talked about for mm -hmm. sure, I mean, yeah. you know, forgiveness on both sides of the coin, um, looking at the challenges that you will come up against as opportunities rather than something that's trying to, uh, letting it tear you apart. Uh, and I think, um, people, people have a tendency <clears throat> when they are together for a while, naturally, and hopefully you're going to continue to grow. Uh, and a lot of times, because growth means change, people are uh, afraid of change and they get really worried or nervous or fearful when their partners, they see changes in their partner. They assume that somehow that's not going to be good for them because they maybe are still, you know, you're not, you don't always grow at the same pace. You're doing different things. You're evolving. You're developing as a human being. Um, so I think being willing to not be afraid of growth, either in yourself or your partner, and beyond that, supporting their growth, encouraging their growth. I mean, if you really, really love your partner and you truly want the best for them, then you would, by definition, want them to grow and evolve as a human being. Otherwise, um, it's you're not being honest with yourself or your partner. So I think that being willing to be your partner's biggest fan and support their growth and be willing to say, how can I, how can I help you? What can I do for you? 
-hmm. And it has to be a two way street. I think that that's really important and not being afraid if if you're kind of at a point where you're just sort of treading water for a bit, but yeah. your other partner is moving forward. Don't be afraid of that. Don't be envious. Don't be jealous. Be supportive because when your time comes, then your partner, if you've got a healthy relationship, will be there for you as well. Couldn't couldn't come close to saying it as well as that. <laughs> it, 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 and really, to me, it it's like I think – and I'm, you know, I don't talk to other couples about things like this. I'm not a relationship person like Lori is, but I think people tend to go in, even if it's a business partnership or romantic relationship, if you go into every situation, looking at it as if it's a zero sum game, meaning if I'm, if I'm giving up something, you know, it's, it's going to cost me. I'm, I'm giving you this. And you look at it as a donation to a charity or or whatever, you don't feel good about it. It doesn't make you happy. You get defensive, you, re you get resentful because you're giving, you're giving, you're giving. Lori has had to do that with me just because of the nature of, of our careers. There's been times when Lori was like 80% of everything that happened under this roof. She had to be because I wasn't available yeah. either physically or, or mentally or whatever. I was focused on something else. So she was giving, 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 giving to her expense. I mean, it, it, meaning in terms of the things that she was able yeah. to pursue and want to do. And if she would have had the opinion of, Oh my gosh, I'm the, I'm giving 80% of this relationship. I'm doing all of this while he's off flying around the country, you know, doing what he's doing. You can easily resent that if you look at it as a zero sum game. But if you look at it as, wait a minute, I'm, I'm investing in my partner. Mm -hmm. I'm not giving my partner something. Yeah. I'm investing in our, in my partner. Therefore I'm investing in my relationship and you'll be looking for those dividends as opposed to feeling like you're just giving something away because you feel like it's a zero sum mm -hmm. game. It's, it's back and forth. It, it will continue to go back and forth. I can't wait for the day when I have nothing else to do but sit around and count the money she makes <clears throat> and take care of the dog and do the dishes and go to the grocery store. I'm cool with that because, she, yeah. you know, she's had to give so much during our time together mm -hmm. that uh, I look forward to making that investment and, and do as much as I can on a daily basis. But again, if you look at it as I'm sacrificing, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that's the wrong way to look at it right away because now somebody's taking something from you and you kind of resent it. You don't know you are or you do, but you do. And that's not healthy. Yeah. No. And I think to, to add to that, though, the, uh, like in that situation, it, it also matters that the person that is maybe, you know, not not there. Mm -hmm. to use your analogy, not there 80% of the time for a phase or whatever, making sure that that person also is acknowledging. Yeah. Recognize yeah. it. dude. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. So you don't want to take the person that's right now in more of a supportive place mm -hmm. for uh, granted. Yeah. No, definitely. Definitely. That, for me, actually, that was a little bit emotional there because it actually brought up thoughts and memories, um, you know, of, of, you know, the other guy, as I call him, um, because, you know, for, for Katie, looking at it in her position, it was always like she was piggy in the middle. You know, she had me on one side. And then if she was dealing with family or there was conflict that were there, you know, she always felt like she was that person in the middle as opposed to, you know, and I did and, and hold my hands up, you know, frequently that I would say, well, why are you never on my side? And it's, it's how about, well, hang on, how about you be on her side? You know, and and now being able to look at that through those eyes, um, mm. you know, that's yeah. that's a difficult thing. Uh, <laughs> looking at that, um, because you know, and, and again, I know many of the nights were, you know, very very difficult because it, you know, it had to be. You know, John's, you know, again, similar to Eric, you know, doing all these things with his business. She's got her own business, but she's got family pressures. She's got you know other pressures as well that's going on, and. You know, I, I at that time was very, very selfish, always thinking, you know, well, how this affects me. And and because I wasn't in that right mindset, because I didn't take care of inner engineering and self-mastery and all the other stuff, you know, it was a case of, you know, in a very, very difficult way. Whereas now, you know, I mean, Laurie, I said this to you, I think the other day when we uh, did the show that, 
my in-laws actually said after we had left uh, my father-in-law's birthday party, that was like talking to a completely different guy. And Katie was like, that's because it is, you know, <laughs> in the best sense of the world. And I just thought, wow, that, you know, for me, that was just an incredible moment in time. And I suppose as, as we're wrapping up here, I know we would, you know, gosh, I mean, there's so many different avenues that we can uh, go down. But I'm intrigued to know, after all the years and all the experiences, how has your relationship changed over the years? Well, I think the biggest thing is, um, we now are in bed by like nine 30. <laughs> that's, that's changed instead of just getting ready to go out. Yeah. That's changed a little bit. But I, honestly, it's matured as we've matured. We are not the same people we were. Thank God in our twenties and thirties. I mean, I mean, I've loved my life in my twenties yeah. and my thirties and my forties and my fifties and now into my sixties. So it's not like I look back at my life, oh, man, I'm sure glad I'm not that person. We had a blast, yeah. but it's just, it's different now. You know, we look forward to different things now. You know, I went through a big, like most people, and I think we both did this, we're both guilty of this, where it's, oh, let's get this. Oh, I'm going to buy a Porsche. Oh, I think I'm going to buy an airplane. Oh, the, all these bright, shiny objects that were available to us because of the situation we we're in. Yeah. Um, Right now, I drive a 1995 GMC pickup with 153,000 miles on it, and I love my truck. There's nothing else. There's no material things that I want. And talk about freedom, by the way. We all talk about, oh, we want freedom, financial freedom, emotional freedom, whatever kind of freedom we want. When you get to the point where you don't want things that no really don't matter in the first place, yeah. to me, I'm more free now than I've ever been in my life. I'm still productive. I mm -hmm. still, you know, have success in the things that I'm doing and all that. But I'm not out trying to find things mm -hmm. yeah. to fill a hole in my soul or something that I think is going to make me happy because I've been around long enough to realize they really won't. Yeah. yeah. Your happiness comes from somewhere other than the things that you can buy. Yeah. I think that's a really good point. So really what I think as we've grown and matured and gone through, you know, these few decades together now uh, and raised kids that the, the, the things like Eric was talking about that were part of what, what were important for us. And that's not unusual when you're in those, when you're in your like thirties and forties specifically, there's a pattern that you get to the point where you are amassing things in your life. You're, yeah. you're, you're bringing thing, things, at, you know, things in, material things, and you're amassing and you're creating your material world. And then you get to a point, we've gotten to a point, and I know a lot of people have too, that in this day and age where all of a sudden you start to realize those things become anchors yep. and, um, and your value system changes a little bit. It evolves. So you start to value more the, the freedoms of not having the attachment to the things and you value, uh, you value more some of the simpler things you kind of go revert back yeah. almost yeah. in a way you're valuing things like going for a walk with the dog, mm -hmm. you know, looking at the geese flying overhead, looking at the beautiful sunrises and sunsets and just enjoying, you know, what you're doing together. Just you, you get to be where you're really realizing that you're just loving doing life together. Yeah. We're just doing life together yeah. with somebody that you really enjoy. I mean, a, a hundred years from now or 200 years from now, if some archaeologist finds our <laughs> cell phones together somewhere in a hole here in Wyoming <laughs> and they f somehow are able to dig into those phones, they're probably going to say, these two love sunrises. What the hell? <laughs> yeah, I've never seen so many pictures of sunrises. And this one <laughs> and the dog, there's like 7,000 pictures of the dog. <laughs> But I don't think that's unusual. No, absolutely. And, and, and you know, just to further the point about the geese, we're actually where we live right now. Um, we see some phenomenal sunsets, um, but also we, we're in the direct flight path of the geese. So I thousands and thousands of them literally for the so last fun. two weeks have just been going over honking first thing in the morning. <laughs> 
And we just sat in the bedroom and it's like, oh my goodness, how many of these things are just going over? That's incredible. I, we, we both love that sound. When we get a flock of geese flying over our house, I'll stop whatever it is I'm doing. If I'm on a phone call, I'll hang up and call them back. <laughs> I mean, I just love this. It, it takes me to another place. And I don't know why necessarily, but when I see geese flying, because they're so graceful, you mm -hmm. know, the wings are barely moving, but they're going 60 miles an hour. Yeah. And that, that sound that they make, I just... I literally, I'll go into a momentary trance. It's phenomenal. It really is. Have you any final thoughts before we wrap up today's show? I got to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> That's my final thought. No, seriously, I I, I enjoy this, John. Yeah. And, and when we do these kinds of things, which isn't very often, it makes me appreciate Lori even more. It makes me more grateful than I already am. So thank you for inviting us. Thank you. And it has been a pleasure. And it, it, it's been the same for me. I mean, folks have been writing in, you know, wishing you guys well from all over the world, um, talking about the importance of date night um, and to show the partner that they are a priority and to bond, of course. Um, and even some of the struggles that people had had. Here's an interesting point, just to, to wrap up the show a little bit. Um, you know, when person X spoke about uh, growth um, he always said that this person wasn't growing. And I think to, to Laurie and to, to Eric's point, we grow at different stages. So if you have this amazing, you know, life-changing, divine, you know, miraculous experience, that's great. But you have to remember that perhaps your husband or wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever, may not have also, you know, had, had that same experience at the same time. And it's important to be mindful of that for sure. Um, because otherwise, like you were both saying, it's very easy then to become resentful of the person and that doesn't you know that that's where things start unraveling so laurie have you any final thoughts before we wrap up no i think i mean i think we made the 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 points that were really important to us and i i yeah. think it's just the period at the end of the sentence is really just remember to stay focused on the things that you really truly value mm -hmm. keep yeah. your focus there and that is a discipline and it is a practice Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, from myself, of course, and for Laurie and Eric, want to thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to share this, tell people about it. It'll be on the Roku TV uh, very, very soon, I believe. We're going to throw over to our sponsors to wrap up the show. But from all of us here at the Mind, Body and Soul Show, we wish you well. Have a great week, folks. Take care. God bless. We'll see you same time, same place next week, where we've got a very unusual guest that's going to be joining us. Take care.